my daughter, Kiara Shield. Heavenly Father, 
we thank you for you being present. Because we come here to your house to meet you, to be in your presence, to learn from you, to worship you, to praise you, to just show you that we love you, to spend time with you, to develop a closer relationship with you. Heavenly Father, we just want you to know that we love you. And we know that you love us. And we thank you and we can't thank you enough. Heavenly Father, there's people that are hurting here. And we just ask and pray on this morning that you rock them in the cradle of your arms. That you keep them and us protected under your feather. Keep us hid and covered under your hand. Heavenly Father, we just plead your precious blood because we know that through your blood we have peace. We plead your precious blood over this house and over each and every single house assembled here together in your name and the families represented here. Heavenly Father, we just welcome your Holy Spirit and we just ask that your Holy Spirit just move in us and on us and all around us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise God, praise God. If you have your Bibles, and if you don't, there should be one uh, close to you. Uh, if you don't see one, you can ask one of the ushers, and they will be more than happy to give you one. Praise God. Just give me, just give me a little second. Give us that together here. Uh, turn to Judges 19. Chapter 19, 22 through 24. When you have it, say amen. I'm telling you, why when, when uh, Judges 19, 22 through 24, when you have it, say amen. Hold up. Hold up. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, God is so good and he's doing such a wonderful, magnificent thing. The enemy, the enemy don't want us to be one. Don't want us to know what he's up to. But just a minute ago, I had to, I had to pray because, uh, my legs was getting real, real heavy. You know, like I was almost about to fall down on the Amen. I said, let me pray. God, give me strength. So I can get up here and deliver your word to your people. Amen. Praise God. Y'all there yet? Judges 19, 22 through 24. When you have it, say amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And it reads, Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. And the master of the house went out unto them, and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is coming to mine house. Do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vow a thing. Amen? Amen. The title of this morning's message is, What Will You Do When the Enemy Surrounds You? What will you do when the enemy surrounds you? First of all, we have to recognize and realize who the enemy is. Because a lot of times, the enemy is surrounding us every day. 
But if we don't have spiritual discernment and we're not leaning towards the Lord so he can open our spiritual eyes, we will have no clue as to who he really is. There are two main enemies that we fighting up against. And one of these enemies surround us every single day. And it is our flesh. It is our flesh. And then, of course, there's Satan, which has been labeled the God of this world. The God of this world. In the scripture, we have a traveler that was a Levite. He was traveling alone from village to village, city to city, and he was seeking the Lord. He had with him a servant and his wife and a couple of mules loaded up with their belongings as they was going in their travels. So his servant told him, he said, well, let's go and lodge in uh, this town for a while, or that town. But the Levite man said, no, I don't want to go into the city of a stranger. I want to be with the people I'm familiar with. So he wanted to be amongst the other Israelite people. So they traveled and they went into a city called Gibeah. As they went into the city, as they went into the city, the man was looking for someone that was also seeking the Lord like him. Someone that was familiar with what he was going through. Someone that could feel his pain, so to speak. Someone that understood what he was trying to do and where he was trying to go. The same thing that the people of God should be trying to do today, amen? amen. But he sat there, him and his servant and his wife, and they didn't recognize anyone and they didn't want to recognize him. They, they just looked over him. They didn't pay him any attention. And they felt that this was something strange because they felt like this was a, a, a town where their brethren, uh, their brethren dwelled in, you know, somewhere that they should be and would be shown love. So that was an old man. He was coming out of his field. And he saw him. And he, you know, he was curious because he was like, you know, here's a stranger in, in the town. So he went up to him and started talking to him and asked him where he was from and found out that they had lived in one of the same places together, which was Mount Ephraim. And so he said, well, I'm here in the town. And he said, I'm going to the house of the Lord. He said, there's no one to receive me into their home. So the old man said, well, come on, I'll, I'll take you in. And the traveler told him, he said, you know, we, we don't need nothing. You know, we got food and, you know, we got everything we need to take care of ourselves and stuff like that. We just need somewhere to stay, you know, until we make it on. So the old man said, okay, come on, you know, I'm a man of God. You know, you can stay with me. But while he was in the house, the word of God said they were, their hearts were merry and they were in there uh, drinking and you know, just they probably was in there talking about God and how good God is. And all of a sudden, say certain sons of Belial came and surrounded the house. Certain sons of Belial. Belial is another word for Satan. Another word for the devil. Just like Beelzebub. So when it said it was certain sons of Belial, these were men that were possessed with demonic spirits. And they came to the man's house and surrounded the house and beat on the door and say, where's that man that's at your house? Yeah. The Bible says, send him outside so that we may know him, meaning so that we may have sex with him. Because these men were wicked and they were perverted. They say, send him outside that we may have sex with him. We want to have sex with this man. And this was the same thing that happened uh, uh, before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. 
when the two angels came to Sodom and met with Lot so that Lot and his family can be saved, the evil and wicked men of Gomorrah uh, 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 came, uh, uh, Sodom came and told Lot, he said, where are the men that came to your house? He said, send, send them outside so that we can have our way with them, so that we can know them. They wanted to do perverted things with them. These men wanted to have sex with men. And Lot told him, he said, I pray you not to do so wickedly with these people. He told him, he said, I have a virgin daughter that you can have. But don't, don't, don't touch these men. But they were beating on the door and they were in a rage and, and they had it made up in their mind that they was going to have their way. And it was, it was almost like a, you know how like when we have deja vu, it was, it was, it was a repeat thing that happened with this Levite man and this old man in the town of Gibeon. The people, the people, uh, now many of us at some point in time in our life have been surrounded yeah, yeah. by the enemy. Right. I know me, myself, personally, throughout my life, I'd have been surrounded by the enemy many times, and it's, it's all kind of ways I didn't try to get out of it. It's times I didn't try to talk my way out of it. Times I didn't try to fight my way out of it. Times I didn't try to shoot my way out of it. Times I didn't just try to hide. Times I didn't ran, and it's times that I surrendered. But people of God, we can't surrender to the enemy. We cannot surrender to the enemy. Because our soul is at stake. But if we submit and surrender to God, say resist and the devil shall flee. Yes, yes, yes. So that's one of the things that's, 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 that's holding a lot of us up because we haven't totally submitted and surrendered to God. The word of God tells us that if we totally submit and surrender to God, we can resist and the devil will flee. Paul prayed to God, kept praying to God. He prayed to God three times and, and asked God to remove what he considered a thorn in his flesh which the word of God said was the messenger of Satan that came to buffet him, which means to strike against him forcefully. But you know what Jesus told him? Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So when you're going through tough times and you're feeling weak, you're feeling grieved, you're feeling sorrow, that's when the power of God to land upon you if you are believing. You have to believe. You have to believe. Jesus said, Know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Which means we got to be busy doing something for the kingdom of God. He said he will give unto each and every one of us according to our works. But he said he will search our hearts and our reins. Our reins are the seat of affection and passion. We got to have passion for God. We got to be affectionate for God. How would you feel and some of us have already encountered this. And if you haven't encountered it, I'm sure at some point or another you will. How would you feel when you say that you believe in God and then you have an unbeliever that don't believe in God, but then he can come and tell you more about God than you know about God yourself? Ain't that something? 
an unbeliever, somebody that don't believe in God, can tell you more about God than you can tell them about God, but you say you believe in God and they don't. That's why we have to get a closeness with God. We have to get affectionate with God. Praise God. In Acts 13, keep your, I want you to turn with me. Keep your thumb, uh, put your bookmark or something right there in Judges. I don't want you to lose that, but I want you to, I want you to turn with me to Acts 13, 44 and 45. When you have it, say amen. amen. Acts 13, 44 and 45. But ain't that something you don't think about that? You know, we tell the people that we believe in God, but then here it is, an unbeliever can come and tell you more about God than you know about God, but you the one believing in People, we got to study. We got to get a closeness with God. Acts uh, 13, 44 and 45. And he reads. Y'all there? Y'all with me? And he reads. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. People of God. The Bible's letting us know when the multitude of people come to hear the word of God, the enemy gets mad. The enemy gets jealous. When the church houses begin to get filled, the enemy gets mad. Yeah, yeah. Now the Jews that the Bible's speaking about right here, these were the unbelieving Jews, not the believing Jews. These were the unbelieving Jews that were, as we call them, church folk. These were people that was so-called religious. The ones that the Bible say having a form of religion, but denying the power thereof. The ones when you tell about a miracle of God, they be like, did God really do that? These people were in the church. But when the man of God came in talking about Jesus, they didn't want to hear it. So they start uh, trying to confuse the people, contradicting anything and everything that they said, and even blaspheming God. People of God, if you haven't encountered it, prepare yourself. Get ready. Because as you become closer with God, the enemy is going to attack you more, attack you harder. And he's going to get more crafty, more subtle, come with more traps, more attempts. But the word of God tells us we got to arm ourselves with the whole armor of God. And when, when Jesus said he'll try our reins and hearts, the reins also is your loins. Your loins. And the word of God tells us that our loins should be girt with truth. So Jesus said he will search us and see if the truth is in us. <coughs> okay, y'all can flip back to uh flip back to Jesus right there. Now, in uh, <clears throat> now in the uh, in the scripture, in the text that we in, the people had surrounded the house. Now, I know a lot of us would probably say, "Well, the man sent his wife with these wicked people." And I know, you know, for me, I was like, wow, how, you know, how could somebody do something like that, you know? Especially, you know, you're supposed to be a man of God, and, you know, is it something we really don't understand? Some things we can't understand. Because even, even, even in, in, in a, a, a Sodom, you know, the man offered up his prayers and died. You know, so, you know, it makes you wonder, what, what, in this time, was, was, was that something you know, considered to be honorable or something, or what? I don't know. 
You know, but people of God make mistakes too. And that's something we got to realize. Because when somebody confessed to be a child of God, we get out our pen and paper. And people get ready to critique every single thing they do. Oh, he didn't say that word right. Oh, he didn't, he, oh man, don't look like they should do this. Don't, don't look like they should do that. I remember one time, uh, one of my wife's relatives told, and she had laughed one time, told her, say, I thought you was a Christian. So what, Christians can't laugh? We can't have fun? Come on now. But, uh, so he sent his wife out, whether we like it or not. He sent his wife out. And the wicked men took her. The Bible say they abused her and had their way with her all night. So you can just about imagine what took place. Then, when it became the break of dawn, they decided to let her go. The Levite man got up in the morning and he was getting ready to go. And he saw his wife laying right there at the doorstep of the, of the man's house that he was staying at. And she had her hands on the, on the threshold, you know, like, you know, she was trying to get in. And she was just laying there. So he called her because, he, you know, he was ready to go and, you know, I'm pretty sure he was feeling sad, missing that, you know, about what happened. And uh, he said, come, you know, come on, let's go. But she didn't say nothing. So then he realized that she was dead. So he had sent his wife off with these people, these wicked people, and they killed her. They killed his wife. So he took her and put her up on the horse, and he rode off with her. And I know from that moment on, he probably, he had probably lost his mind pretty much. He didn't, he didn't know what to do. Come on now, you, you know, you, you, you already, you, you know, you know you made a bad decision. And then now these people didn't kill your wife. So, you know, his mind probably just all scrambled up, just all scrambled up. He's like, what, you know, didn't know what to do. So when he got home, he took a knife and he cut her up. He cut her up into 12 pieces, bones and all. He cut her up into 12 pieces. Because the man even though it was a gruesome thing, the man had made up in his mind that he had to do something about this. Now, it was a strange thing that he did, but wait until the outcome. So he cut her up into 12 pieces. And what he did with these 12 pieces was he sent each piece to each tribe of Israel. Because he wanted more than anything what God had wanted now. That was for the 12 tribes of Israel to be united, to come together as one. And the word of God says in Judges 20, verse 1 says, Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one. From Dan, even to Bathsheba, with the land of Gilead, unto the land of Mizpah. Because he felt that this, this huge tragedy, some kind of way, he had to turn it around. And we all know that God will turn the situation around. He will use something that was negative, something that was bad in our life, and turn it around for the good to those that love him. So the people, the 12 tribes of Israel, they all came together because they all got these pieces of his wife. And they were like, what, what has happened? What is going on here? And they all came together in council and they said, we got to do something about this. So they all came together and they went to that city and they said, where are these men that done this? Where are these sons of Belial that killed this woman? Where are they? Send her out. We're going to put them to death. Yeah. But the children of, 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 of Benjamin, 
that were that were uh, made up the majority of that town, they said, no, nah, y'all can't have them. Y'all ain't gonna come in our town and tell us what to do. Yeah. Y'all ain't got it like that. Yeah. Because see, they was they wasn't with the God that we serve. So they like, no, nah, I don't care what y'all God say or what y'all got, but y'all ain't finna come in here and run nothing. So they say, okay, we're gonna go to war. So they went to war. The children of Israel that came together, it was about 400,000 men. And the, and, the, and the children of the Benjamites that came together was, say, maybe 27,000 or something like that. So they went to war. Now the first two days, the first two days of the war, the evil people killed 40,000 men. And it was only 20-something thousand of them, and they killed 40,000 of God's people. So, of course, I'm sure the people got a little discouraged, you know. But on that third day, they went to God again, praying, asking God, and saying, what should I do? What should we do, Lord? What should we do? They were praying. They was fasting. They was burning burnt offerings and peace offerings to God. And they was waiting on instructions from God. And God told them, say, on this third day, I will deliver them into your hands. So on that third day, the wicked people thought they still, they thought they had it like that. They thought they had it like that. So the first few people they killed, they said, oh yeah, we can kill these people just like the other day. Oh yeah, this is easy. And the next thing you know, the people of God came up from everywhere. Yes. Because they was lying in wait. They ambushed them. And they went in. And they killed everybody. There was a few that got away, but they chased them too. But look how God turned it around. It started off with wicked men coming around and surrounding a person's house. People that was, keep in mind, this man was on the way to the house of the Lord. The same thing that happens with us when we on the way to the house of the Lord, the enemy comes to surround you and attack you. Yes. He was on the way to the house of the Lord and the enemy surrounded him at this house. But now the people of God have surrounded that whole city. Yeah, yeah. They surrounded that whole city and destroyed them. The word of God tells us in Proverbs 19, 22, and say, Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. And see, that's a lot of our problem. We don't want to receive instruction because we too busy wanting to do it our way. It says, Hear counsel. Hear the word of God. So that you can be wise in the latter end so when the enemy does come to surround you, you will know how to fight in the spirit. You won't have to try to shoot or you won't have to try to swing. You won't have to try to hide. You won't have to try to run. You'll be able to fight in the spirit because you'll be armed from God. Word of God says where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. See, that's another reason, people of God, why we assemble in the house of God. Because the word of God says in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. So if you assemble yourself around spiritual people, you're going to get what? Spiritual counsel. Praise God. But people of God, I, I, I don't want... I don't want y'all to think that this is just a, 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 a natural thing because all the time you're not going to see the enemy. This is a spiritual thing. Turn with me right here and we're going to wrap it up. Matthew 12. I was just going to tell it to you, but I, I, I think God prefer you read it. Matthew 12, 43 and 45. When you have it, say amen. amen. Matthew 12, 43 and 45. Amen. Matthew 12, 43 and 45. People of God, this is spiritual warfare. 
I don't know how hard we can stress it, but this is spiritual warfare. The word of God said, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and finding him. <laughs> that himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. People of God. The word of God is telling you that once you are healed, once you are purified, once you are cleansed, and the unclean spirit leaves your body, he is mad. He is so mad that he's going to get reinforcements. Said when he leaves, he is going to get seven other spirits that are more wicked than him, and he's coming back beating at your door because he want to get back inside of you. Yeah. People of God, this is spiritual. Yes. You're not going to always see the enemy. Yeah. The enemy can be surrounding you, and you look around, you don't see no people, yeah. but the spirits, they are trying to get back in their house. But once we get it swept clean, we got to keep it clean. That's why we got to continue to pray. We got to continue to fast. We got to continue to study the word of God. We got to continue to praise and worship. Amen. If the devil don't come knocking on your door, that's because you are already with him. If the devil don't come knocking at your door, that's because you are already with him. You just like one of the sons of Bilal that came beating on the man's door and say, tell that man to come outside. The word of God say he didn't have no rule over his own spirit. It's like a city that is broken down and without walls. That means you no good for nobody. I don't care how big or how large you think you are in this world. The word of God says if you don't have no control of your own spirit, you are like a broken down city, a wasteland, without walls. That means you have no protection. You have no protection. Praise God. Once again, the title of the message is, What Will You Do? When the enemy surrounds you.